Hey, it's Mr. Wells with the LA again. We've been reading Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. Uh, you have your notes to fill out uh, for this as we go along. You won't have uh, much to fill out each day, but as we go along, you should be able to fill out more uh, of those notes. When we last left, our hero, uh, Hercule Perrault, he uh, had come to Istanbul, uh, hoping maybe uh, to uh, have a few days sightseeing. And when he got there, he found a telegram saying he needed to return to England Im immediately. He tried to book passage on a train, but unusually for that time of the year, the train was already full. He happened to run into an old friend of his, Monsieur Bach, who it ha it was a director uh, of the railroad company. And so Monsieur Bach, who was also traveling on the train, insisted uh, that Perot be allowed on the train. Um, while there, he shared a compartment with a young man named McQueen. McQueen was traveling with an older man, a Mr. Ratchet, who gave both uh, a Perot and Bach a very bad feeling. Well, let's pick it up. Chapter three, Perot refuses a case. Monsieur Hercule Perrault was a little late in entering the luncheon car on the following day. He had risen early, had breakfasted almost alone, and had spent the morning going over the notes of the case that was recalling him to London. He had seen little of his traveling companion. Monsieur Bach, who was already seated, gesticulated a greeting and summoned his friend to the empty place opposite him. Perrault sat down and soon found himself in the favored position of being at the table which was served first and with the choicest morsels. The food, too, was unusually good. It was not till they were eating a delicate cream cheese that Monsieur Bach allowed his attention to wander to matters other than nourishment. He was at the stage of a meal when one becomes philosophic. Ah, he sighed, if I had but the pen of a Balzac, I would depict this scene. He waved a hand. It is an idea that, said Perrault. Ah, you agree? It has not been done, I think, and yet it lends itself to romance, my friend. All around us are people of all classes, all nationalities, of all ages. For three days, these people, these strangers to one another, are brought together. They sleep and eat under one roof. They cannot get away from each other. At the end of three days, they part. They go their several ways, never perhaps to see each other again. And yet, said Perrault, suppose an accident. Ah, no, my friend. From your point of view, it should be regrettable. I agree. But nevertheless, let us just for a moment suppose it. Then perhaps all these here are linked together by death. Some more wine, said Monsieur Bach, hastily pouring it out. You are morbid, mon cher. It is perhaps the digestion. It is true, agreed Perrault, that the food in Syria was not perhaps quite suited to my stomach. He sipped his wine. Then, leaning back, he ran his eye thoughtfully around the dining car. There were 13 people seated there, and as Monsieur Bach had said, of all classes and nationalities. He began to study them. At the table opposite them were three men. There They were, he guessed, single travelers, uh, graded, and placed there by the unerring judgment of the restaurant attendants. A big swarthy Italian was picking his teeth with gusto. Opposite him, a spare, neat Englishman had the expressionless, disapproving face of the well-trained servant. Next to the Englishman was a big American in a loud suit, possibly a commercial traveler. You've got to put it over big, he was saying in a loud nasal voice. The Italian removed his toothpick to gesticulate with it freely. Sure, he said, that's what I say all of the time. The Englishman looked out the window and coughed. Perrault's eyes passed on. At a small table, sitting very upright, was one of the ugliest old ladies he had ever seen. It was an ugliness of distinction. It fascinated rather than repelled. She sat very upright. Round her neck was a collar of very large pearls, which, improbable though it seemed, were real. Her hands were covered with rings. Her sable coat was pushed back on her shoulders. A very small and expensive black toque was hideously unbecoming to the yellow toad-like face beneath it. She was speaking now to the restaurant attendant in a clear, courteous, but completely autocratic tone. You will be sufficiently amiable to place in my compartment 
a bottle of mineral water, and a large glass of orange juice. You will arrange that I shall have chicken cooked without sauces for dinner this evening, also some boiled fish. The attendant replied respectfully that it should be done. She gave a slight, gracious nod of the head and rose. Her glance caught Perot's and swept over him with the nonchalance of the uninterested aristocrat. That is Princess Dragomirov, said Monsieur Bach in a low tone. She is a Russian. Her husband realized all his money before the revolution and invested it abroad. She is extremely rich, a cosmopolitan. Perot nodded. He had heard of Princess Dragomirov. She is a personality, said Monsieur Bach, ugly as sin, but she makes herself felt. You agree? Perrault agreed. At another of the large tables, Mary Debenham was seated with two other women. One of them was tall and middle-aged in a plaid blouse and tweed skirt. She had a mass of faded yellow hair unbecomingly arranged in a large bun, wore glasses, and had a long, mild, amiable face rather like a sheep. She was listening to the third woman, a stout, pleasant-faced, elderly person who was talking in a slow, clear monotone which showed no signs of pausing for breath or coming to a stop. And so my daughter said, why, she said, you just can't apply American methods in this country. It's natural to the folks here to be indolent, she said. They just haven't got any hustle in them. But all the same, you'd be surprised to know that our college, uh, what our college is doing. They've got a fine staff of teachers. I guess there's nothing like education. We've got to apply our Western ideals and teach the East to recognize them. My daughter says, the train plunged into a tunnel. A calm, monotonous voice was drowned. At the next table, a small one, sat Colonel Arbuthnot alone. His gaze was fixed upon the back of Mary Debenham's head. They were not sitting together, yet it could easily have been managed. Why? Perhaps, Perot thought. Mary Debenham had demurred. A governess learns to be careful. Appearances are important. A girl with her living to get has to be discreet. His glance shifted to the other side of the carriage. At the far end, against the wall, was a middle-aged woman dressed in black with a broad, expressionless face. German or Scandinavian, he thought. Probably the German lady's maid. Beyond her, were a couple uh, leaning forward and talking animatedly together. The man wore English clothes of loose tweed, but he was not English. The only the back of his head was visible to pro. The shape of it and the set of his shoulders betrayed him. A big man, well made. He turned his head suddenly, and Perot saw his profile. A very handsome man of thirty-odd with a big, fair mustache. The woman opposite him was a mere girl. 20 at a guess, a tight-fitting little black coat and skirt, white satin blouse, small cheek black toque, perched at the fashionable outrageous angle. She had a beautiful foreign-looking face, dead white skin, large brown eyes, jet black hair. She was smoking a cigarette in a long holder. Her manicured hands had deep red nails. She wore one large emerald set in platinum. There was coquetry in her glance and voice. Elle est jolie et chic, murmured uh, Perot. Husband and wife, eh? Monsieur Bach nodded. Hungarian embassy, I believe, he said. A handsome couple. There were only two more lunchers, Perot's fellow traveler McQueen and his employer, Mr. Ratchet. The latter sat facing Perot, and for the second time, Perot studied that unprepossessing face noting the false benevolence of the brow and the small, cruel eyes. Doubtless, Monsieur Bach saw a change in his friend's expression. Is it your wild animal you, uh, you look? he asked. Perot nodded. As his coffee was brought to him, Monsieur Bach rose to his feet. Having started before Perot, he had finished some time ago. I return to my compartment, he said. Come along presently and converse with me. With pleasure. Perot sipped his coffee and ordered a liqueur. When the attendant was passing from table to table with his box of money, accepting payment for bills, the elderly American lady's voice rose shill and plaintive. My daughter said, take a book of food tickets and you'll have no trouble. No trouble at all. Now that isn't so. Seems they have to have a 10% tip. And then there's that bottle of mineral water and a queer sort of water too. They didn't have any Evian or Vichy. 
uh, which seems queer to me. It is. They must, how do you say, serve the water of the country? Explain the sheep-faced lady. Well, it seems queer to me. She looked as tastefully at the heap of small change on the table in front of her. Look at all this peculiar stuff he's given me. Diners or something. Just a lot of rubbish, it looks like. My daughter said, Mary Debenham pushed back her chair and left with a slight bow to the other two. Colonel Arbuthnot got up and followed her. Gathering her up her despised money, the American woman followed suit, followed by the other one like a sheep. The Hungarians had already departed. The restaurant car was empty, save for, for Perot and Ratchet and McQueen. Ratchet spoke to his companion, who got up and left the car. Then he rose himself, but instead of following McQueen, he dropped unexpectedly into the seat opposite Perot. Can you oblige me with a light, he said. His voice was soft, faintly nasal. My name is Ratchet. Perot bowed slightly. He slipped his hand into his pocket and produced a max matchbox, which he had handed to the other man, who took, uh, who took it but did not strike a light. I think, he went on, that I have the pleasure of speaking to Mr. Hercule Perot. Is that so? Perot bowed again. You have been correctly informed, Monsieur. The detective was conscious of those strange, shrewd eyes, summing him up before the other spoke again. In my country, he said, we come to the point quickly. Mr. Perot, I want you to take on a job for me. Hercule Perot's eyebrows went up a trifle. My clientele, Monsieur, is limited nowadays. I undertake very few cases. Why, naturally, I understand that, but this, Mr. Perot, means big money. He repeated again in his soft, persuasive voice, big money. Hercule Perot was silent a minute or two. Then he said, what is that you wish me to do for you, Monsieur er, Ratchet? Mr. Perot, I'm a rich man, a very rich man. Men in that position have enemies. I have an enemy. Only one enemy? Just what do you mean by that question, asked Ratchet sharply. Monsieur, in my experience, when a man is in a position to have, as you say, enemies, then it does not usually resolve itself into one enemy only. Ratchet seemed relieved by Perot's answer. He said quickly, Why, yes, I appreciate that point. Enemy or enemies, it doesn't matter. What does matter is my safety. Safety? My life has been threatened, Mr. Perot. Now I'm a man who can take pretty good care of myself. From the pocket of his coat, his hand brought a small automatic into sight for a moment. He continued grimly, I don't think I'm the kind of man to, uh, to be caught napping. But as I look at it, I might as well make assurance doubly sure. I fancy you're the man for my money, Mr. Perot, and remember, big money. Perot looked at him thoughtfully for some minutes. His face was completely expressionless. The other, uh, the other could have had no clue as to what thoughts were passing in that mind. I regret, Monsieur, he said at length, that I cannot oblige you. The other looked at him shrewdly. Name your figure, then, he said. Perot shook his head. You do not understand, Monsieur. I have been very fortunate in my profession. I have made enough money to satisfy both my needs and my caprices. I take now only such cases as interest me. You've got a pretty good nerve, said Ratchet. Will $20,000 tempt you? It will not. If you're holding out for more, you won't get it. I know what a thing's worth to me. I also, Monsieur Ratchet. What's wrong with my proposition? Perot rose. If you will forgive me for being personal, I do not like your face, Monsieur Ratchet, he said. And with that, he left the restaurant car. All right, we'll see what happens next time. Uh, talk to you later. Make sure to hit like, subscribe, and all that good stuff.